please rise for the pledge. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, agenda, agenda adjustments. Um, there's one adjustment. There will be no executive session this evening, and this meeting is being videotaped. And we'll move on to public comments. Any public comments tonight? Sure. Just state your name and where you're from, please. Yep. Paul Harley Whitman. Okay. Leading the poll. I will not just go away. You think I want to be here? I've got hockey tonight. I don't care you can keep pumping out these totally standard responses every month to my comments. This is, administration is inexperienced and it shows, not just online with school stats and rankings, but also in action, or in my case, lack thereof. Does being a teacher make you a good administrator? Because I remember not too long ago this administration were just teachers. Why does this school rank lower in experienced teachers and administration than state average, and the only school in all schools that buys into the charade to be so? You offer a far better teacher to student ratio and pay about average, but actually higher, figuring in the low experienced staff compared to other towns. It seems ideal conditions to me. <clears throat> Numbers seem skewed as you've got second lowest percentage for experienced teachers compared to supporting towns, with less than 1% higher than the lowest, but paying more than $5,000 per teacher in comparison to lowest, which ends up being over $300,000 for less than 1% more experienced teachers. To meet state standard for experienced teachers is almost 4.5% and with previous price point, that's over a million dollars to have two current teachers be experienced. This area is desirable, just makes no sense why not only the students but teachers and administration leave so often. 14 staff members have quit or fired in the last three years with the third year still ongoing. Another six retired in that time span. Roughly speaking, in the next three years, one out of three teachers will be gone. Over 30% of the staff is turned over in three years, and that finger, figure is trending higher. 14 is such a funny number. That's the amount of kids needing emergency medical services and ambulance during school. That's only from two previous years, as this year's numbers aren't complete yet. Over the last six years, that number is trending upwards as well. What happens when we pull the curtain and we see through the smoke and mirrors trick? Maybe just tell the people you brought in a police officer because the kids are just fighting too much. Why not just throw weights on the kids, dragging in their countless books and tools as they're juggling a trade and schoolwork because you want to hit your target goals, so pile up the schoolwork during shop cycle. Don't forget to excel at your trade as well, and if you seem good, you're going to get pushed even harder in special one-on-one -on -one education while the other kids get busy work because you want good Skills USA results for that Skills USA money. Don't forget to get a job for co-op as well. Heck, you'll even post a picture on your Facebook page showing multiple hazards of, of a kid at co-op. You've practiced next town. <clears throat> you've practiced in the next town over in the morning for a school sport with a very tight time frame with limited showers and the classic high school hierarchy. Because if you're late, they don't want to hear about it. You're in trouble. Did you know after my countless meetings, this school finally expanded their size options for shop mandated custom shirts? But if you play a sport and don't fit their limited sizes, hopefully by the end of the season, they'll get that sorted for you, but don't hold your breath. They don't really care. Sports here are free, so we're gonna body shame you. So shape up there, kids, because our motto is, we're lucky to even have a team. So fit our limited sizes or kick rocks. Funny thing, if you have a legitimate reason to seek sports at another school, they refuse to allow it, it can't be helped. I guess just leave if you don't like it. Safety is our number one but our way or the highway, because OSHA doesn't know what's safe. Funny how a teacher deems a hard hat unsafe for well over a year and says nothing to parents, just hassles the kid till a breaking point, leading to that teacher sneaking around and stealing it, saying nothing. But after finding out he was caught to have an attitude towards the ordeal, admitting he thought the student had an unsafe hard hat, but it's actually in full compliance and higher rating than school issue. Well, now it's a distraction, and to really push the issue, damage it before returning to student. So administration decided all students must comply to a lower grade hard hat and all others will be thrown away, even in your face, if you ask to use the one your parents bought you. Because you're a kid and I can push you around. Don't worry. You can work the next few weeks with no hard hat till we can get you a school issued hard hat. Don't just take my word and certainly don't take this school's word either. If you have a child that goes here or graduated, 
just recently. Go ask them the deal. <clears throat> Go ask them the deal, because kids don't always tell you everything, and this school makes their total disregard look so casual. I'm just an older brother doing what's right for my family. This school be damned. Thank you. Okay. Well, I have a brief statement I'd like to read. Um, on behalf of the committee, I wish to point out that the committee is limited to discuss areas within our jurisdiction. Uh, those areas are evaluation of the superintendent, policy, and budget. As such, I cannot speak on the details outside our jurisdiction. However, I can say that I have spoken to the superintendent about the issues that were arised uh, because student safety is a priority and because having a real dialogue is important. Uh, both the superintendent and I have previously offered to meet to discuss concerns in great depth. We look forward to that opportunity. So. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'd sure. also like to add that uh, I think your emphasis on dialogue is very important. Much of any concern that any member of our community has can probably be resolved and certainly unpacked more at the appropriate level. So we stand ready to continue to have conversations. I appreciate this committee's patience. Much of what you might hear in the public comment period may be confusing, um, may not have any context, but uh, as you said, Mr. Chairman, we stand ready to have these conversations uh, if, uh, if that opportunity for dialogue arises. Yep. Right. Thank you. All right, we'll move on. Um, ask for a motion to approve the set of minutes. Motion. Motion made by Hanover. Second. Second by Noah. Any discussion? All in favor? Right. Opposed? Okay. Bob's the same. He wasn't there. No, Rock him. Sit to it also. All right, motion carries. Student of the month. Is there any bother? great pleasure to introduce you to Brianna Ruffin. She is a Rockland resident and a senior in culinary arts. She was our October student of the month and she's here this month because she was very busy playing in the volleyball tournament on that evening. So we are pleased to have her here tonight. Her proud parents are here with her this evening, Michelle and Peter Ruffin. Brianna is an honorable student at South Shore Tech who has been in cooperative education at Black Rock Country Club and is a baking intern at Sadie Mae's Cupcakes. She's a three-season athlete. She is captain of the varsity volleyball team and softball teams, and is a varsity basketball player, too. Her coach, Mr. Gil Martin, says, Brianna, big dog, Ruffin <laughs> is exactly what South Shore Tech stands for. She is hardworking, dedicated, approachable, and has the work ethic that others should try to strive for. Bree? may have an intimidating presence on the court, but she has the warmth and kindness that her teammates feel when they are around her. Brianna places high value on the totality of her experience here at South Shore. Culinary arts instructor Mrs. Montero calls Brianna a great mentor and peer to her other culinary students with tremendous work ethic to, and strong professionalism. Her academic teachers, Mr. Chamberlain, Mrs. Borgia, Mrs. Glass, Mrs. Cromack, and Mrs. Brennan came in a choir of compliment for Brianna for her perseverance, maturity, and compassion for others. In addition to her positive contributions to her trade and academic program of study and sports, Brianna is a member and vice president of our Skills USA chapter. She's attending the spring 2019 service trip and program advisor Mr. Falano commends Brianna as a wonderful addition to our Houston trip last April. She kept us all well fed. <laughs> she is a kind and compassionate student who goes out of her way to make other students feel comfortable and welcome. Please join us in celebrating Brianna Ruffin as South Shore Techs, October 2019. Student of the month. And Brianna, I'm going to turn the mic over to you for about just for a second. And tell us what are your some of your most memorable moments at South Shore Tech? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone who voted for me and nominated me. Um, 
I'm a little nervous. I mean, I have well, a What makes you most, most prideful for, about being a student here at South Shore Tech? I mean, I just like how like everyone's welcoming, like teachers, students, fac like all faculty, everyone. Anytime I see someone in the hallway, I say hi, Mr. Hickey. I always have a conversation with him in the hallway, Miss Baldner, every morning. <laughs> Same with the robbery. <laughs> so I would just like to thank everyone. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you. She really does represent the community that South Shore Tech is, and we're very proud to have her here. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, staff recognition, uh, Mr. Aubrey. Oh, all right, Mr. Oh. Boyle. Thank you. No, no, no. Get, get the <laughs> Good evening, committee. I would like to introduce you to Nicole Connor, who is uh, the administrative administrative assistant in the vocational office that serves uh, that houses both me and Mr. Mello. So, Nicole, um, I'd like to say a couple words about Nicole, who has been uh, named the staff person of the month. Nicole joined South Shore Tech last year. Uh, in September, and since then she's hit the ground running, um, overseeing numerous different projects such as um, overall support to the entire vocational office and all the vocational teachers that come into the office on a daily basis. Uh, cooperative education, um, along with Nicole, we've been able to bring the co-op program here to a new level, and thanks to Nicole's oversight and management, uh, we're able to keep track of these items and log statistics on a daily basis. Um, Nicole has had a, a huge impact on our school's program advisory. Uh, we've been able to grow membership over the past couple years and you know continue to look at ways to improve our advisory dinners and um, evenings. Nicole has had a, uh, a big hand in our school's discipline flow as discipline typically starts within the vocational office and she's often the first person there to triage whatever might be coming our way. Nicole also is a vital support to the school's uh, Skills USA program and FFA program, often helping students with paperwork, um, advisors of Skills USA with their paperwork, and, and helping everybody get registered and uh, you know well aware of what they need to participate in Skills USA and FFA activities. Nicole has also had a significant um, job with overseeing part of the. Um, community requests that come in for outside projects by managing a, an Excel spreadsheet with timelines and dates and updates on projects that are ongoing off campus. Nicole, I'd like to turn it over to you and see if you have a couple words to, to say <laughs> about, <laughs> about your experience here so far. Oh, my experience. Um. <laughs> it's been one. Um, I've, I've worked in um, a, several different types of educational settings and um, coming here at South Shore Tech has been a great experience. I'm really lucky to work for Bob and Keith. They're great to work for, but also to work at a school where really every day I feel supported and valued and appreciated. So it's, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you and congratulations to Nicole. All right, next we'll hear from our student representative, Emily Ingram. Emily? Hi. Hi um, <laughs> so recently, student council put on their annual food drive, and this year we, raised, we collected 200 cans, which is always nice. We donated them to the Rockin' Food Pantry. Um, so this Friday, Skills USA will be doing testing of all their students from 10 to 12th grade, and they will be taking a 50 question test related towards their trade to show them how, like, worthy, not like worthy, but like how well they know their trade to proceed on to skills competitions. Um, the game of Powder Puff has been moved to November 25th, which is next Monday, and Powder Puff is a flag football competition with, where, with the females throughout the grades. This raises spirit throughout the grades and is an overall fun time for everybody. Uh, student council has continued our tradition of selling spirit shirts to the various classes. Students who wear these shirts will be able to get into SSVT home games for free. Our goal with these shirts is to increase 
uh, school visibility and promote the student participation at our sporting events. Um, from this Sunday, November 24th to Tuesday, November 26th, some of our students here will be taking a Skills USA trip to Marlboro and they will be strengthening their leadership skills with Skills USA. These students will participate in all kinds of things like team building exercises, community service, and some different workshops. Um, Spirit Week is taking place from this week into the next week. Students are encouraged to participate in these events to raise school spirit. Um, we have all kinds of different days from 80s day to blackout day to Disney day and so on. Pep Rally is coming up. It's next Wednesday, November 27th. Um, this will begin with our routine performed by our tree leaders, followed by several events run by the student council. This year we'll be running a relay sack race, a balloon butt pop, and a tug of war. NHS is putting on their annual tree of warmth. They'll be doing this in the front office where they put their tree. This is to collect <coughs> hats, gloves, scarves for those who are in need and cannot afford. The dates for this are currently unknown. Um, student Council will be putting together their Toys for Tots. Um, we collect toys for kids who cannot afford them during the holiday season. And then Skills USA will be hosting their um, the state's holiday party this year. Um, this is for those who are less fortunate and don't get to truly celebrate any holidays. It's on Saturday, December 14th, and state officers from Skills will be coming here to decorate the school with our Skills chapter to host um, this event for kids and their parents for breakfast, crafts, and gifts for everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. All right, move on to the treasury reports. Jim? Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, the new package this evening is your treasury report for October 31st. Um, first page lists all of our, our bank accounts. At this point, it's um, cash balance is totaled a little over $4.7 million. Um, <coughs> we also have separately in the OPEB reserve account $675,000. So. Um, cash is a little bit down from our ending at, at, on June 30th, but um, what we do is we do the, um, we bill our uh, assessments, our quarterly assessments to the towns um, effective November 1st. So um, the next page will reflect that. Next page is the, uh, the revenue during the course of October. There were no revenues from the, um, from the, our, our eight towns. Um, the only monies that came in were some miscellaneous items plus our, our regular Chapter um, 70 check of $370,000 per month. Um, the billings for our member towns go out on November, November 1st, as, and we bill them quarterly. For all of our non-district students, we also bill them on November 1st. Uh, we bill them twice a year, so this is the first installment that just went out to our non-district district towns. Um, as you're aware, the student um, count as of October 1st is the number that gets um, submitted to um, DESI as, as our enrollment for the year. So based once that October 1st deadline you know, comes, we can then um, finalize the number of out-of-district towns and um, get that, um, those bills out and so forth. So, um, and as the enrollment has increased for non-district towns, we are looking at a, a number that's higher than last year's um, number as well. So that's, that'll, that'll be a good influx of um, cash into the coffers for this year. So. Um, our final page is the expenditures for the month. Total expenditures were just a tad over a million dollars. Again, the, the lion's share of that, again, is the payroll, $663,000. Um, there are no major items of concern. Again, the supply budget on line 28 is, um, is, is up there, $67,000, but that's as these, the teachers get um, the classrooms all settled up and they start getting their supplies in for the, the second wave of supplies for the, um, the next quarter of the, the school year. So um, everything's going as planned. Uh, the office is running smoothly and there's really no, um, no major concerns. So that's the Treasury report. <coughs> I ask for a motion to approve the Treasury report. <coughs> motion made by second. Citroen, second by Whitman. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Right, motion carries. Um, Thank you. Um, we also Jim, have a um, budget transfer of $5,000 um, into the technology line item for um, the science department. Um, 
and it's coming from the, the, the books and instruction line item. It's just a matter of the, the classification of, of purchases and so forth. So we just try to keep the technology separate from the books and instruction. But so they're, they're requesting a five thousand dollar transfer. Okay. Pass a motion. motion. Motion made by Whitman. Second by Hanover. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed. <coughs> Right, motion carries. Thank you. Um, Jim, anything else? A um, couple things. Uh, we're working with Bruce Norling, our auditors, to get them in the um, first week or so of December. Um, a couple things are holding up the audit this year. Um, one of, again, the thing that came in the GASB 78, which is all the alphabet soup of the accounting world, um, requires all the pension <coughs> accounting that we have to do that are just included <coughs> on our financial statements. Where we have to drag the the actuarial reports from Mass Teachers Association, we have to drag the actuarial reports from Plymouth County Retirement into our financials as our share of everything. Um, as of last week, <coughs> the Plymouth County numbers haven't been um, released yet; they're they're imminent and so forth. The the other piece is that um, we we <coughs> normally do a our own internal actuarial um, calculation every three years, and based upon the movement and the, the climate out there. We're going to have that done this year as opposed to next year, just to make sure the numbers are, you know, solidified and so forth. So the the general atmosphere out in the in the municipality world with all these pension things is that you know, it was it was required two years ago, and it's sort of as the dust is settling, we need this other pension um, calculation, actual calculation done this year. So um, the data has been sent to our consultants, and they're probably going to be able to spit out a report within the the near future to timeline. Um, finalizing all the audit numbers and so forth. So that's one thing that's on the table right now. And unfortunately, the, um, my final um, notice is that um, Sylvia Huffnagel Coppola, who's been in our business office for three years now, I think, um, three and a half years, um, she's given notice and she's going to be leaving um, the school at the end of December. So we're actively looking for a replacement in the purchasing accounts payable um, realm of the business office. So. Um, she's been a great addition to the um, to the office. Everything's been run smoothly, but um, she'll be leaving us at the end of December. So um, we're going to wish her well, and um, we will miss her dearly. So that's it. Thanks, Jim. Chairman, nothing from the chairman tonight. We have no subcommittee reports, so we'll move on to Superintendent Director. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to uh, thank our culinary program, our administrative staff for organizing yet another successful fall advisory night, which was earlier this <coughs> month. We had uh, close to 100 advisors in attendance, great student speakers, wonderful food, and a great opportunity for programs to begin discussing budget proposals for fiscal 21. I had an opportunity to meet with most of the committee chairs prior to the meeting, and we had a good conversation. I asked them to focus their attention with their departments on always looking at long-range capital planning, necessary equipment for years down the road that we won't be talking about now, but fiscal 22, 23, 24 are just as important for planning purposes, and to also give advice relative to industry trends that we may not be currently considering, as it's very important for us to, uh, to be aware of these trends upcoming. Those trends could lead to changes in curriculum or changes in equipment. They were very receptive. As you know, we have two of these meetings a year, and so we'll have one in the spring, followed by a general advisory meeting that concludes our year, where we have a dinner here in the, in the restaurant in May. So a great start to the year in terms of advisors, parents, students uh, participating in that, uh, in that activity. I'm also happy to report that we were one of the school districts selected to participate. Uh, it's, it's document five in your packet, but we had applied for a competitive grant to receive cybersecurity training. And there is, uh, uh, there's always something else to be learned in this area. I was uh, talking to our technology director, Crystal Faluzzi, and uh, the smaller details are essentially, this is a year-long training. Most of it is online. It involves the entire staff. And from the time that we commence the training, it will be, a ca it will be one calendar year. And they can provide some on-site support as well. So. Uh, I look forward to periodically reporting out to you what the training has included. And we're very happy that the state chose us to be a part of that initiative. Uh, I'd also like under my report to talk about something typically not done until December, but I wanted to give uh, members of the committee just an early indication of uh, some, a couple of important items I think that'll come up next month when I make a budget presentation. And it's gonna be on the screen, so, uh, 
I'll ask, thank you. Yes, it's just, it's just a few slides. It's Kevin, is it all right if I stay here? Is that you focus on the screen? Thank you. Uh, so just, just as a review, you recall that we had a, a facilities audit done in late 2017. It was published in early 2018. Came out with 43 recommendations about what we could do to essentially improve and maintain and modernize the building. Uh, to, to simply keep what we have, upgrade what we need, not adding an extra square foot, not making anything bigger for anybody, is probably close to $11.8 million, summarizing all of those, if you will, maintenance and upgrade expenses. Were we to add on to the building, as you might recall from previous meetings, that could be, these were spitballing ideas that we contracted with the engineers of adding 30 to 40,000 square feet, addressing some of the long overdue uh, wish list items. Uh, that would probably add an additional 36 to 40 million dollars. And as a rule of thumb, uh, cost escalation each year that goes by is about 4%. So you can, you can roughly expect that if we continue to talk about the 2018 report, I'll eventually need to put asterisks next to these numbers and include cost escalation. So the, the larger numbers only <coughs> exist in our world if our friend MSBA comes a knocking. And this will be the 5th December that I'll be waiting for the unofficial word one way or the other. But we've reached a point where we're gonna to have to start to talk about some of the slightly bigger ticket items that still fall within the maintenance category, not the modernized expansion category. Our approach has been to focus on facilities items that are standalone. We can start it and complete it, and it doesn't have a major impact on other operations. And we've been chipping away, of course, at the list to the best of our ability. The sad truth is that even if I could report to you favorably that we are invited into the MSBA core program, it could be upwards of four years or more before we might realize some of the changes we've long sought. And so there are some changes I feel as though can't wait until, if you will, 2023 were we to be invited in 2019. There's a, it's a lengthy process. It's a worthwhile process because we could stand to have over 50% of our costs subsidized by the school building authority. However, with each year that passes, the cost escalations go up. So what I'd like to bring your attention to is that next month I'll be talking in a little more detail about two specific facilities priorities. Uh, I'll take the one on the right side of the screen first, which is septic. Now the facilities audit suggested that we, uh, we, do, we undertake some septic repairs and we're, we're getting some additional information right now, but the rough estimate that we had at the time was about $250,000. It is not an overhaul of our entire system, by no means is it that but it does involve the replacement of some parts of the system that are starting to show its age past its useful life. So, we're, so what, one of the items that I will be including in our fiscal 21 budget is $250,000 to put toward septic repairs during the course of fiscal 21, very likely, I shouldn't say very likely, but uh, certainly not work that you undertake when school's in session, right? but it would be something that we would focus on. That amount of money, $250,000, where you are no strangers to seeing capital requests involving our facilities that are in that ballpark. But it's the item to the left that I think is some brand new territory. Many of you have experience with the fact that in 2010, we replaced the roof over our 1962 edition. And now for those of us a little longer in the tooth who still call this 1992 edition the new wing, this 92 edition has a 27-year-old roof. The engineers said in 2018, and they continue to say now that it's, it's past its maximum life. We've been very aggressive with maintenance, and I think we will continue to be able to squeeze a little more time out of it. We don't want to operate in a crisis. I have memories of buckets in the hallways in the 1962 building for an extended period of time during some bad, some bad weather. Adjusting for inflation, Repairing, uh, replacing the roof over the 1992 edition would cost about $1.4 million. Could you go back just one slide, Mark? Yeah, thank you. In addition to that, prior, of course, to doing any construction, we would need to retain a, uh, an owner's project manager and a designer for the roof. So what I'll be talking about next month in a little more detail is the idea that in fiscal 21, I would be coming to you with a proposal to set aside 
approximately $240,000 for the OPM and designer fees. That number comes from a, that's a percentage of the overall cost. About 10% for a designer and about 3.5% for, for an OPM. So my initial thought is that during the course of fiscal 2021, we would convene our capital projects subcommittee, we would seek a project manager who would then, as part of the project manager's charge, would assist us in, in securing a designer. You might, you might be surprised to hear this, but to, to book in roof work, which of course would have to happen in the summer, so I'm thinking ideally it would be the summer of 2021, July 1st, 2021, we're gonna start work. In order to have work lined up, someone under contract for July of 2021, we're probably gonna to need to go out to bid in the fall of 2020. Mm -hmm. so, so if you bear with me, on July 1st of 2020, we begin our work to securing a project manager and a designer. We have plans done up, we go out to bid, and then the, 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 recent, the recent advice I'm getting is, that's how long of a window of time that, that we might need. So why is it important to talk about the roof now if we're not doing a roof in the next 12 months? Well, part of the reason is when we go out to bid and we get those and we, and we get some estimates, we're going to have to then talk about the school committee's authority to authorize debt and inform our towns because our towns under, the, under legislation have the ability to call a town meeting within 60 days of, the, of a regional school committee authorizing debt. I recall how there was unanimous support from our communities to replace a roof. But I hope you can appreciate the I, this is what makes it awkward. We can't necessarily wait until, if you will, May in order to then start construction in July. May meaning the bulk of our town meetings. So for right now, my goal would be to bring this rationale to you next month make a very clear timeline and a case to our communities when we're going around doing our fiscal 21 conversation so that our towns understand that if we do secure estimates and we want to then actually borrow money for a project, we may need them to be on board and it may not be timed correctly with a town meeting. We are very, I would be very reluctant to ask you to authorize debt outside of a normal town meeting calendar but it just might, it just, the timing might be off. Unless we were to push a roof project out to say fiscal 2022. So for right now, that's, that's the initial, that's my initial thought. We start with the first phase. We look at what the numbers are and then we, then we have conversations about the next phase. And then the final slide I have here is really, mostly it's a summarization of, of what I had said before. Uh, I'll focus on the, um, I guess I'll focus on the second bullet, which is that we're very fortunate to have had continued support of having money in our stabilization fund. As Jim, as Jim showed in his report earlier, there's about $1.3 million in our stabilization fund. We still need to make sure that some money is left in that fund to cover an eventual MSBA invitation for feasibility. But I would not, but I certainly could see us using some measure of our stabilization fund to help, to help offset construction costs. And you will also see from me next month in the fiscal 21 budget, a proposal as I have brought to you in the last couple of years, a proposal to put some money into stabilization to increase, to increase that number a little bit more. Uh, the good news as, as the final bullet on the slide says is that we were able to, um, we encumbered money so that we could uh, prepay, that we could basically offset our 2010 roof debt. So in fiscal 21, uh, we won't have any debt service from our 2010 roof project. So that is, that's, I think that's progress, that, that's a good offset. But this is not the kind of topic that should just come up as part of a general operating budget, if you will, presentation. This is definitely a multi-year approach and it warrants further conversation. So knowing that knowing that, that that was a lot right there, Mr. Chairman, I, I certainly would take any immediate questions if committee members have it have them. I do. Yeah. Okay, I know Tom. Uh, to ask the towns to hold a special town meeting one or two months prior to the annual town meeting 
is very difficult to get done because of the fact it costs three to five thousand dollars on a town meeting, even bad. though it's a special. Um, you know, how long do you think the roof project would take to do? No, my experience from 2011 is that the th that roof project started and ended in the course of a summer. Okay, I'm so, saying because if we get if we go out to bid and, and, and we well we get some numbers because we need to go with numbers to the towns and we say okay town meeting is in May beginning of May most of them yes that means that if in fact it's approved then you'll have the rest of May June July August September to start it right I understand that if we choose to go with the bid can we say to them okay the, uh, we chose uh, on the RFP if we chose this particular company to do it for, uh, and it, it pertains to whether or not we get approval from the town so in other words you may so will a company line line you know they, they don't have to order the product and stuff or line up their men or, mm. and say okay I have a project at Celso Botech but it has to be approved by the towns and we won't know until May, they may turn around and say, well, the heck with that, I'm gonna go with a... You're, you're right, ready. right, Dan. Yeah. We, we, need, we need to have the funding secured before we, could, before we could contract. Right. The way the regional law reads is that after a regional committee authorizes debt, the town has the option to call a town meeting. Right. So my, my take on it would be, since it has to be unanimous, Right? Since, since in, order to, in order to do something that involves debt, it has to be unanimous. What I would hope to get from our towns, if we talk about it in great detail and we answer as many questions as we can, is that if there is no objection from our towns, then the governing boards of those towns would not necessarily have to, they would not have to call a town meeting. Now, if there was some objection, if there was some opposition, for instance, how much would it cost my particular town? If we were to go out to bid and secure this in, in the fall of 2020, what would happen is that amount of money calculated through our regional agreement calculations would become part of the fiscal 22 assessment. It would, it would populate the debt service column. So it wouldn't be an immediate payment or anything like that. It would be getting a, a contractor under contract, not commencing work until the start of the new fiscal year. So for us to do that, it would, it, the clear indication would have to come from our communities that they're in support of us taking this on. All right, if you, now I know you're doing Whitman, I think in January you have to be with the FinCo? Yes. All right, so if you present that to them and they see no, they come up with it saying that they'll support it, chances are, of course we will. But I mean, when will you have meetings with, and all your meetings with FinComs in all the eight towns? Well, the, January? Right, so, so the good news, Dan, is that n none, of, none of the meetings in this budget cycle yeah. have anything to do with the cost of the roof, other than the concept. What I would put in the fiscal 21 budget is for the OPM and the designer, which right. we, can build into our, uh, we can build into our capital costs within, within the, one, the, the, the one, I guess, unified vote that we always have at, at a town meeting, which is voting for everything. Okay. It, it would be after that. We would... So then on July 1st of 2020, we would begin the process of securing an OPM, securing a designer, designing the project, and going out to bid. Right, and then the project would start. So it would, it would, it would be almost, it would be a year from now right. so that, we would, that we would right. secure. So what would happen <clears throat> if we turned around and we, we presented it to the finance committees of all eight towns? Yep. Right, you know, I, year in advance, yep. estimated numbers because, you know, <coughs> yes. and see what the feeling is, and put an article, and I'm, whether or not we can do it now, put an article on the town meetings this May for the following year, their sense of the meeting. My, the my, my, my only concern... Uh, well, you can have average numbers, you may be off on a thousand, but believe me, on a millions of dollar project, a hundred thousand dollars doesn't mean anything. Okay. dealing with it for 20 years, yeah. 25 years. I, I think other than the fact that we wouldn't be asking to appropriate, we wouldn't be asking to use the money during that fiscal year might, might be a concern. Yeah. However, 
we can definitely project out, because there are multiple variables, including right. what would be the length of the debt. That obviously right. has, would have an impact. So, yeah, yeah I what, mean. What the, what you present, what ex the exactly. Bob had a question. Hey, Bob. Uh, question, you keep talking about uh, design and uh, the project manager. Yes. We, we don't have that type of capabilities of doing that in-house yeah. with our licensed contractors that we have here? Uh, no, we, we would, I think because we would need, we, by law you need a, uh, an OPM for costs that are around 1.5 million, okay. but uh, in, so, ter in terms of an architect. Okay, so now on the other thing, I just hate seeing, you know, spending money for something that's already existing for architect and engineers to make money on it. But the other thing is that, say we do not get approval by the towns, hmm. then what do we do? What are our options? Do we go to a private loan ourselves, or do we? Is that something that we we have to reach out and do, or is that something that we can manage now in house? We would have to amass enough money in our stabilization fund in order to pay for it ourselves, and then this committee could fully control the scope of the project without having to get, uh, without having to get approval from the towns. Mm -hmm. So, so were, were that to, were that to happen, that that would be. Uh, the committee's ability to ath authorize debt means that we're linked directly back to our town meetings. But if this was, so for instance, if I was coming to you for say an $800,000 septic overhaul, that is something totally that could be decided <coughs> here were we to combine, say, stabilization with some, with some budgeted money. But unfortunately, I think we're, we, we, would, we would be tied to uh, town, meeting or town meeting approval. And if we and if it wasn't approved, um, I it I would treat it the same way as MSBA, which is the roof's one year older and <laughs> bond. <laughs> bond. <laughs> buy buckets, <laughs> buy some blue tabs. I'm yeah. Bob. Yeah. Yeah. The, Bob the, question. the only thing I can think of, we can stack our stabilization. We've got a gear coming up now. Instead of returning an astronomical money to reduce our budget, take as much as we can from our incoming monies. Yes. Stack our stabilization so that we only have to borrow a minimum amount of money that would affect the towns. Mm -hmm. And it's possible we could get two years of stacking and stabilization by doing that. We can get this year, this fiscal year, plus possibly some leftover money in the next fiscal year. Yes. Yes, that, that, that is, so that's that possible. That would leave us still money for a major project yep. for design and architecture. Yes, that, it, it, it almost would be a self-funding project if we could do it that way. But I can still see us borrow out of, what you say, a million and a half of the roof? Yes. So I can still see us borrowing maybe three, four hundred thousand, yeah. which is peanuts, really. Yes. So there, there are definitely some puzzle pieces that are obviously we don't know, but I think I, I think that that's an important alternative yeah. to consider. Can you use non-tuition resident tuition for that? That that would be an offset to the budget, so okay. it, it would show up elsewhere in the budget okay. yeah, as a capital item. Oh, okay. One one fiscal clarification. Yeah, Jim. Um, yes, we also have um, as you remember that when we did the boiler project many years ago, like four years ago. We have the excess and deficiency, our our state, you know, calculated number, which is probably in the five fifty to six hundred thousand dollar number. When we did the boiler project, we opted not to borrow on the boiler project, and we used our own internal E and D to fund that for, I believe, it was about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We had we had MSBA money <coughs> to to pay for some offset. of that project, but we do have that E and D that is available as as Bob's mentioning. And, and, and from a finance standpoint, it's only November. We don't know where we're going to have any money to stack next year in the in the world in in the to the stabilization. We're we're still running things very tightly in the finance side, but and hopefully there'll be some surpluses as we get closer to the end of the year. But there's no guarantee that um, we we're going to have enough to cover the, all the the costs related to that. So yeah, anyway. but it's history has shown we've been able to do it. You know, you, yeah. you got our E and D, we can. Take some of that. It is it is Plus. it is entirely possible to combine E and D stabilization and a capital request in a fiscal twenty two budget yeah. to cobble together a number that doesn't require borrowing. You know, because we got going in 
you're planning <coughs> on budget money for stabilization. Yes. And that you got your E and D for. Yep. And if we use that money prudently, we could have a good size E and D if we don't have the un unexpected expenses. Yep. Uh, we could, uh, you know, self fund it yep. or down close to it. Yeah, but if I, Jim, do, by doing it that way, what would it do for our bond rating for the capital school system? Well, I mean, it's it's. You've got to have money in stabilization to maintain a good bond rating. Yes. Well, we're 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 close to the maximum. You're only allowed to, to maintain right. E and D of five percent of your your budget. Mm -hmm. So and we are within thousands of dollars of that that threshold. So we are we are. Um, I mean, any like we had a couple years ago when they the the. Director of Local Services disallowed one of our audited items. We ended up refunding some money to the towns because our E and D right. number exceeded the five percent threshold. So uh, we are close to that E and D, and and this is again for s this type of project would be that would money may be available for that. So and again historically, as Bob said, we've had some surpluses at the end of the year that which we've been able to build into the into the um, <coughs> stabilization fund. So hopefully there will be, as Tom said, money there available. Um, money within the 2022 um, yeah. capital number. Even so. non-resident tuition money. Right. <coughs> as an offset. Yeah. And the non-resident yeah. tuition money, again, for those at home and, and so forth, we use that money to offset the, the local eight towns yeah. assessments. Yeah. And, and as I mentioned in the report that I gave earlier, um, we're looking at probably a $450,000 increase in our non-resident tuition because of a, a larger number of enrollment from out-of-district towns this year. Um, I believe last year, in the last two years, um, as non-resident tuition has gone up, we've asked m less and less money from our member towns. Um, so I think last year was was a like in the years confused. We asked totally from our towns like seventy thousand dollars last year. The year before was less than what we had asked the previous year. So we we that our towns assessments are pretty much have been level funded the, the last three years because of the increase in the, in both state aid. Regional transportation and the the um, non-resident tuition. So, and, you know, it's uh, you know the purpose of the non-resident tuition. If we under the state law, we can use that money to support the education of those students and right. a yeah. facility maintain the educational facility. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chairman, so, so I, I, I appreciate I appreciate the early conversation on this. It is it is important. If the roof say that they didn't pass the roof, and then the roof failed. Well, let's, well, stay come in and say, look, at, you need a new roof. You're approved. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's certainly it, the MSBA's so, priority. The water is pouring down. <laughs> we have an obligation yeah. to maintain our building, but the number one priority, if you looked in the legislation under the MSBA's charge, their their top priority is about you know imminent safety. Right. Yeah. So, uh, that's and that's usually the priority statements of interest that they look at when they're when they're accepting people into their program. But <coughs> plus the fact that we're proactive. We're trying to be. Yep. And they're also now, we always had the idea that we could get the money back after we spent it, but now they're saying no. Correct? Yes, which is why I want to be very deliberate and not overreach. Yep. They could invite yeah. us. They could they invite could. us. But so a roof and a septic system I would put near the top of the you, you need them <laughs> list. And yeah. if we got to do them ourselves, then so be it. <laughs> All right. All right. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll end my report by turning it over to our administrators. For their reports. Hello again. My report is very brief this evening. The last time we met in October, I gave you some good news about our attendance data comparing um, September, <coughs> October 2018 19 to, to August through October of 1920. And we talked about the fact that we had seen a, a pretty significant improvement in our attendance and that is in great part due to some hard work of our attendance committee guidance counselors having a lot more difficult conversations with students um, a, a greater outreach by Rachel Haynes one of our uh, uh, teaching aides who is supporting us with personalized phone calls home to students who who need them and uh, great work always by Marie Mariani at the front desk making sure that kids get two classes on time and um, that their attendance is reported effectively um, today we celebrated students who have had some excellent attendance and the uh, electronics program excuse me the electrical program had a 99.5 percent 
awesome attendance in September and the Met 2 footprint program had 99.5% awesome attendance in October so we celebrated with a pizza party this afternoon. The kids seemed to really appreciate it as did the faculty members who were grateful for us celebrating their hard work and efforts in getting their students to in on time. They mentioned specifically the, the, the work that they do in their programs to encourage students to come to school and to make significant note of it when they are not in school. So uh, a celebration today. My only other comment this evening is that is an invitation. We have the National Honor Society induction ceremony here on December 18th, just an hour prior to your meeting. We'd love to have you as guests for our National Honor Society induction. It's at 6 p.m. in the lecture hall. You are welcome to attend. Thank you, sir. I, I want to thank the administrators for the work they did on the uh, advisory meeting the other night. I uh, stopped and I saw the General Assembly and I walked around a lot of the shops and uh, it's really come a long, long way over the years. The advisory members are actually doing what they're supposed to be compared to listening to the, uh, the instructors say, we need this and that. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to watch it over the years and they did a great job putting it together this year and it's based off the administrators that get it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. That goes a long way from Mr. Boyle, Mr. Mello, and mm -hmm. Ms. Connor who was here tonight who started to change along with Mr. Hickey change our goals with advisory and we're reaching out to co-op employers, we're reaching out to more people in the community to bring in and help us help our students do what we want them to do best, and that's be good, solid members of the trade unions and the career choices they have. So thank you very much for acknowledging that effort. Uh, I'm here tonight to talk about accountability. So we talk usually in October about MCAS and how great we did and that lovely SGP. But one of those things that MCAS also helps us with is it helps us with accountability for the school, and it's a great data dive and there's lots of things to be uh, gone through and explored and we've done that with the leadership team and looked at places where we were taking, um, we weren't up to snuff, places we were lacking, places where we can see improvement and so we've gone through and we've identified those places, I'm bringing two of them to you tonight to just give you an idea of what we're looking at when we're looking at these numbers. So the first one is uh, our high need students or students with disabilities, their math scores. Their math scores are not the right trajectory that we want them to be at uh, compared to the state. And we talked about how good our math students were, but there's this group of students who are not performing where we'd like them to see. Now we do have um, places or we do have things in line. We use uh, Study Island and other devices like that to help students number facts, go back and review fractions, go back and review decimals, and all those basic stuff as they're learning algebra and geometry and calculus and all those type of things. But for this one group, that seems not to be enough for them right now. So we are working with two of our, um, this is not just the leadership team, we're working with two of our stellar math instructors to come up with alternative plans that go beyond these type of things and bring in more uh, opportunities for these students to improve. The other place I want to identify is the um, high school completion rate or dropout rate. Okay, these are students who leave here but do not continue on somewhere else. So we have students who leave and they go back to descending towns because the week down and week off doesn't work for them or the trade they thought it was isn't what they thought it and they go back or they miss their friends. There's a myriad of reasons they go back. But every once in a while we have students and last year we had three three students who left the school but did not go on to further their education. And when you have that happen, that becomes a major um, mark against the district, against the school, because these kids fell through the cracks, they, were not, they did not continue their education, they did not get a high school diploma. So we are developing, with our guidance counselors once again, going to those people that are on the, on the front lines with the kids, working with them to develop a exit plan, an exit strategy with these students, and also giving them a myriad of options and places they can go, and also doing interventions prior to that point. Mm -hmm. If it's part of the kid comes for a half a day, maybe the kid is school phobic or has school anxiety, 
Maybe the kid has an other issue and we need to work with them to get them back into the fold of the building. That's what we're looking to do, is we don't want these kids to just walk away. If we can get them here half a day, that's a half a day win for us. We're willing to work with that. We've been in discussions over the last couple of years is something called the Bright Program that Whitman Hanson has and other, other school districts have. We've been looking at employing that as well. <coughs> not to that extent, but it's a program just like this, where the kids who come back from long-term absences or this type of thing where they're not quite ready to be in the school of 600 kids in the hallways, that can be kind of intimidating for some students. So this is a program where they can come back in, there is paraprofessionals to help them, kind of ease them in, get them caught up in the work, maybe they go to one class a day, maybe they go to two classes a day, but they have this safe place where they can go and kind of decompress and then go back <coughs> out again. So that is also the other, one of the two main arms we're looking at right now. Any questions about accountability? That's not good. All right. The last thing I want to bring is something I mentioned earlier on. It's one of the focuses that Mr. Hickey, myself, Ms. Berry, and the leadership team is having. It's on um, students taking lunch, or not lunch, sorry, eating breakfast. We talked about this before. We have about 75% of our free and reduced lunch students partake of our lunch program, but only about 20% partake of our breakfast program. So we are in the process of trying to highlight our breakfast program and everything it has to offer for students. <coughs> I've mentioned before that we put an extra 10 minutes into the first period class so they have time to eat their food and you know whatever they have to do because they get off that bus, they're in the cafeteria, and then they're off the class to eat. We've done some grab and go type of stuff. We're doing some promotional materials. We've done some phone calls home to parents. We have new posters. Uh, Vincent Costa, who is a junior in our graphic communications department, has been working with me on these posters. The first of these went up today. We're going to be putting them around the building, promoting our breakfast program. And for all of us who remember back in the 50s, the you know, breakfast cereal companies told us breakfast is the most important meal of the day. But we can prove through data analysis that breakfast does mean the kid is more attentive, they're more on task, and they're better able to perform. All right, so we do have here, the September numbers were pretty stale. They were about the same as last year. But the numbers in October are up 15%. It's only one month, but we're going in the right, trage right directory, direction, all right? So we're happy about this. We gotta keep up the momentum and keep it going with our students. Ms. Berry, who is our food services director, is on board. She's been great help changing the menu up, helping us be able to allow kids to run in, get the stuff, and get to class on time. So this has been a great program all around for our students. Our teachers have been on board, very receptive to it, so I can't say enough for the entire staff. Anybody have any questions on this one? No, I'll make a comment. Oh, Mrs. Fun. Berry. If she feeds the kids, they'll come. Yes, if you feed the kids, they will come. We know that in any meeting, right? Yeah. 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 It's funny you should talk about that. My son David graduated when I was 33 now, so I'm a long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. When he came here, right, his, we had math, we had teachers conference with his, with his teachers. They would laugh to say that well, they would get here, have to get here early, the bus, he'd get the bus early in the morning, be here early before school. Mm -hmm. He would have his iced tea and his bagel every morning, like he was getting ready to go to work. <laughs> and that was years ago, and, and he, he still does that today. And it's just amazing how uh, time to progress. And, 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 and I, I think you hit on something, Mr. Sabuji. We're also looking at, do kids eat at home? Yeah. Do they just not eat breakfast? Some of our kids eat lunch at 10.30 in the morning. So there's a number of factors yeah. we have to figure into our data analysis yeah. and look at what we're doing, but we're excited by the 15% growth from one month. It's just something we need to see sustainability across for a number of months to see that we can do this. Yeah, I mean, for the busing where we have eight communities, kids have to get on that bus first thing. I mean, pretty early in the morning. Yeah, some of them are getting on quite early, 6.15. Right. Even the kids who are coming from out of district are often just as early. Right. And the no, kids from Hull are getting on. He's here a half an hour before early. school starts, so he gets his, his tea and, it's, it's and his bagel, and he sits there and like he's getting ready to go to work. Mr. Muller. Yeah, yeah. we have the round table now here in Quincy. That's in the corner every morning. And uh, 
If you can you convince those that the food is better here, you want to see the line of the, of the kids. Oh, I know. They're not all Votekis, but, but there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. And that goes to, I, I totally agree, but it goes to what Ms. Baldwin was talking about, attendance and the numbers that have been reduced. The kids are there earlier this year than they were last year because they're here on time. Yeah. So however they get that breakfast, I don't care. I just want to make sure they get it. Either that or put mice down ahead. Uh, Can I no, 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 no. We're not going to hurt any public businesses. We support everybody in the community. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Mark. All set? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right, awesome. All right, on the unfinished business, we'll hear from Mr. Salvucci. He'll give us an update on his MASC conference. Okay, thank okay. you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, this is the 74th annual uh, MASC conference that I went. I haven't gone to all of them, but going that uh, I'm going to say. He didn't say funny, my 74th. You know, and it's funny <laughs> that uh, Mr. Aubrey was talking about some of the issues and some of the classes that I went to. One of the classes I went to on Wednesday was the fact that they were saying that public schools have changed since I graduated in 1960, right? So, I mean, and things are different today where you have kids that uh, have problems going, you know, in schools and, and how the schools deal with it. And some of the, you know, one of the ways that they're dealing with it is that some of the teachers are mentoring the kids. And this is exactly what we're doing. They're mentoring the kids that who have a problem to sit down and talk with them. And then some of the kids who they find out that come from problem homes, the teachers are now, some of the schools are having a, a coffee hour with the parents. You know, how can we help? And it's amazing, you know, what they're doing. And then you got some city schools where if kids are caught using drugs or anything like that, they're sent to a state facility to deal with it. That's something that I don't think we have to deal with, but you never know. And then one of the other uh, classes that I went to was uh, the financial challenges of regional school systems, and it was mostly on dealing with the uh, assessment method of statutory or alternative method, dealing with the way we do it, we do it the statutory method. But some towns aren't, as uh, I'm well aware of, because we have an issue, but other than that, on how and when that, that started, I mean, I mean, it was started, you know, the statutory of the state in 1670, this Massachusetts looked at schools and saying that we need to educate our kids. And then in, in, in 1779 is when the government in Massachusetts said that we have to make affordable public education. That's when they started taxing people for it. And then in 93, when they realized it was even getting worse, they come up with a circuit breaker. And then with the whole facility, of, of funding for schools and it's where towns are paying you know 40 you know the state is paying towns 41 percent but then in the cities and towns have to pay 59 percent of the budget for education so i mean it was interesting to deal with that another uh class that i went to is tapping into student ideas students going to different classes come from different cultures different religions. Uh, they all have different ideas. A lot of them are non-English speaking students. So they tap into different ideas of different ways of teaching. And they, and they talk to the students and they're educating their teachers to deal with different methods of teaching students with uh, issues such as non-English non speaking teachers, which I thought was <coughs> interesting. And then we had one which, uh, I thought it was, I usually there's one class that I really get into, and this was uh, on trades, you know, career tradesmen transforming from a vocation or uh, a business going into teaching. And, right, Jack, you, same situation, right? I had a teacher that sat beside me where he was an electrical, he was an electrician doing his job. He decided he wanted to teach. So, he got his, he's got his credentials. He was hired by his, a, a vocational school system. Had his first day of class and he panicked. How do I teach kids what I know when it's all I, I do it day in, day out, but now I have to teach what I do, That's right? Tough. And so what they came up with, and it's a program on mentoring new teachers, mentoring new teachers on how to teach in their class which I gave Tom uh, 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 
a, uh, a number to call if, in fact, they're considered it. But I think that I think we believe we do that here. Yes. Yeah. You know, they did that when I started too. Huh? Quincy High did that too. Right. So I mean. And, and let me tell you, this guy was scared out of his mind. He said his first couple of first couple of weeks of school, <laughs> he didn't know what to do. He says, "I know how to do it, but how do I teach the kids to do what I know how to do?" And, you know, and Jackie went through the same issue. Uh, we had a delegate uh, assembly, and all of them passed all the uh, resolutions that we sent to the state. I think it was nine of them. Um, a couple of them I spoke on. Some of them I thought, uh, the first one I'll say was, was by Silver Lake Regional School System. Banning uh, polyester, uh, uh, styrofoam from the schools. Styrofoam cups, why wow, we have paper cups. They want the state to make, to decide to make that a rule. I get up and I say, I don't object to that, but I think it's something that the schools can do on their own and I think there's more important things for the state to be looking at than worrying about styrofoam cups in the school system. But it passed. Uh, another issue that, uh, that passed that I thought was a good idea was the fact that they wanted teachers, they wanted the state to eliminate, I'm trying to think, uh, MTEL, what is it, MTEL? Yes, state uh, uh, teacher testing test, program. Teacher testing, because there's a lot of people coming from out of state, coming into Massachusetts. They were qualified teachers, but they could not pass this. They thought that needed to be updated to be more progressive because you got teachers from out of state or from out of the country that could teach our students in areas that we have yet to learn how to teach them. I thought that was pretty interesting. We had one on climate change. They all passed. Um, another one on poverty and children, how to deal with them. There was no discussion on it. It was automatic. Uh, there was one on charter school reform. No, no discussion on it. It passed without discussion because of the fact that charter schools aren't up, you know, held to the same standards as we are, and they think they should be. And uh, there was another resolution on, uh, which I thought was kind of ridiculous, but that's just me. Resolution that that all schools need to have menstrual supplies in all ladies' rooms. That's when I asked my when I read it. I asked my wife. She goes, "Yeah, it's it's always been in school. So you go to the nurse's office. Why do they need a law for that?" I says, "I don't know." But that was you know, that was my uh, observation on it. <laughs> But other than that, it was, it was a pretty interesting few days. Uh, there's a lot of things that I learned and a lot of different things that I learned that were uh, different from what I come up with. One of the good things that I liked is the fact that last year I complained about the no flag, right? And I brought it right to their attention again, and there was a flag on stage. Nice. The American flag. I made sure of that. And they, they listened to me. So other than that, <laughs> it's all I had. Nice. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Danny. All right, we'll move on to new business. Uh, business. 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 <laughs> I asked for a motion to accept uh, donations as listed. So oh. moved. Motion Second. made by Citroën. Second by Whitman. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Next is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 10B is uh, is a repeat of what you would have seen last school year, and that is uh, another out-of-state uh, field trip, a service trip back to Houston. All right, I'd ask a motion to approve the service motion. trip to Houston. Motion Hold made by Rockland. Second. Second by Situat. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Tell them to look at the highways. There's like eight, eight lanes in each direction. They're massive. They're all over the place. <laughs> The way they should be. <laughs> we're changing numbers. <laughs> yeah, we're changing yeah, exit yeah. numbers, yeah. Well, going on, okay. Um, <laughs> all right, next time we have surplus declarations. I ask a motion for the surplus to surplus the items listed. Um, motion, motion made by uh -huh. Hanover, second, second by Situate. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next, warrants. Warrants. 8, 8A, 8B, 9, 9A, 
and 1019 totaling one million three hundred seventy one thousand three hundred seventy three dollars and seventy cents second second by the situate any discussion all in favor Aye. opposed motion carries thank you uh, any requests for action okay uh, we're not going into executive session tonight so Maybe I should just brought this up on the public comment, but I think uh, we should acknowledge that the great success that the, uh, the athletics teams have had here this fall. Oh, yeah. yeah. Making tournaments, uh, football team, volleyball teams, soccer, yeah. whatever they all have had, I think they should all be recognized yeah. for the great yeah. fall season that they've had. So. Okay. Great, uh, great. Some of them still playing right now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and you're Thanks, going Bob. to football team are going to. Um, we nope. we we went deeper and we went deep into the MIA playoffs, yeah. but we're now uh, a competitor for the vocational right. uh, tournament that uh, starts the first of two potential rounds starting this Saturday. Right, it was the yeah. regional finals. Yeah, we heard that. That was the, the regional finals against West Bridge Water. Yeah. I just want to comment on this, Mahoney. Uh, we are bringing in our athletic teams as the students of the month in December when we wanted to wait for all the seasons to be over. So you're going to meet all these, the volleyball team and the football oh, nice. team and the golf team and all those people are coming in. Great awesome. idea. Great. Great idea. Thanks, Mr. Albert. Has anybody seen the, uh, the Shields ad, the MRI ad with the, the girl that's going to have surgery on holding up her number? She's a duck, duck boat driver. Oh, and she has a problem with that. She's been <laughs> driving so many championships around. <laughs> Her finger is has nice. to be operated on. All right. Kind of a funny ad. Yeah. That's funny. So, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, made by Whitman, second by Situate. All in favor? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, any discussion? It's done. All in favor? Aye. Aye.